Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. But if you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. Vaginas are absolute magic. And Ollie is here to give them the respect they deserve. That means shame-free supplements made with clinically studied ingredients to keep your pH in check. And your pleasure a priority. Put yourself on top. Go to Ollie.com today. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Hey, I'm Jamie Glowacki, and you are listening to Oh Crap, I Love My Toddler, But Holy Fuck. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, hey, guys. Welcome, welcome. I'm very excited. Today, I'm talking with Shonda Morales. She is a psychotherapist and a licensed clinical social worker, and she is the author of two books. But check out the name of these books. The first book is Breathe, Mama, Breathe. And the second book is Don't Forget to Breathe. So how great is that? (laughs) You know, I'm a big proponent of breathing. So welcome, Shonda. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks for having me, Jamie. Yeah. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your work? Sure. So I am mom to two kids, 20 and 10. So 10 years apart. And people find that interesting. That's been an interesting experience for me as well. And like you said, I'm a psychotherapist. I've been in private practice for a number of years in the field for about 25 years and practicing mindfulness um, and everything related to that and stress-related disorders, treating women especially for a number of years. And so I bring all of that together and help moms, moms who are struggling, moms. And I know today we're going to talk about mostly moms in the trenches with little ones who are, you know, who have those everyday stressors as we all do. Yeah, yeah. We were so you guys, we tried recording on my I'm doing a new recording platform so I can get all fancy on YouTube. And because nothing ever goes according to plan, we had to switch over to Zoom. So we had already <laughs> recorded like eight minutes. So we're we dug in a little, but one thing um Shonda and I were talking about was she works with actual like CEOs and high-powered people. But I was like, hey, listen, I have some CEOs and high-powered people in my audience, but mostly I have moms who are exhausted. And one of the things you guys know that I care so, so, so much about is the pause, the pause before we lose our shit. So we always have that. If we break it down, right, our kid does something, it activates us, it triggers us. That is almost always going against some sort of core value we have, or it's a childhood wound of our own, right? But we can't always unpack that while we're parenting. Like, do we... (laughs) Like we can try, but trauma work is so hard when you're in the trenches. And mm. I swear to God, kids were put here to just pour a little salt in that wound. So you're, they're like, deal with it, deal mm. with it. And uh-huh. this generational trauma, right? Oh yeah. But before that happens, when we get white hot, when we get red with rage and we start saying those catastrophic things that are the true things that do the damage, losing your shit isn't causing your kid damage. It's the things you say, the always, mm. the never, Right. So what do you have for us? What do you have for us for that pause? Because I'm thinking some mindfulness. <laughs> right, right. And I just want to say, so not only words, but you know, it could be, it's not just words that could be damaging. It could be the unpredictability of our reactions. And mm-hmm. so the more, the more in control we are of our reactions and how we respond instead, then the better off everybody is, as we know. So coming back to fight or flight, I'm sure you've talked about this before, but you know, what is going on when we are triggered, whatever that looks like for each of us, it's like, it is so fast often. I mean, sometimes it's building and we can recognize that, but it's, it's fight or flight is triggered. And so what we know is our body's reaction to perceived danger. And of course our kid not listening to us or having a tantrum is not dangerous or a serious threat to us, but our mind and body don't distinguish between a real threat, a car coming at us, let's say, and we have to jump out of the way versus a toddler having a tantrum on the floor and we feel helpless. And so it feels exactly the same in our bodies and our minds. And so what we do know is that if we take those nice deep breaths, if we can remember and catch ourselves to recognize what's happening and take a couple of deep breaths, we send a signal to our brain. There's no immediate threat. There's no immediate danger. And our body and mind can kind of then choose to respond a little bit more. So so it's interrupting that it's that automatic pause, like you're saying. So 
what I teach is that if we are practicing a little bit of meditation, quiet, whatever you want to call that every day, we are practicing that it becomes familiar. It's a, a muscle memory. Just like if we're learning to swim or something, we can't just dive into the pool for the first time ever and be like, Ooh, here I go backstroking. You know, it's, we need to practice that on a regular basis. And then we've done it more often. So every day we're practicing a little bit. So we remember to use it and it just happens more automatically rather than our automatic habitual reaction of just losing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes perfect sense. First of all, practice. So I always say parenting, it's just practice. It's a practice. And like, we all expect to be so good at it. And I even said to a friend the other day, they said something about, oh my God, you're so good at this. And I was like, dude, I'm 16 years, 16 plus years into this learning curve. I said, you're five. Like in any other industry, 17 years experience versus five years of experience is like, no dear, but we expect to be so perfect. Right. But mostly, like I love the breath, but you just said something that I think could be so helpful too, because I realize I do this. One of the reasons, guys, you want to get good at this pause is because let me tell you about teenage parenting, right? Oh, oh, oh yeah. You mm -hmm. have to pause because like their sarcasm and their eye rolls are like Tourette's. It's like, they don't even mean it. <laughs> my son will literally will be like, Ugh. oh my God, Mom, I'm sorry, I love you. Like he just can't, it's like the worst kind of impulse control, right? My audience knows Pascal and I, my son had it. We had a glitch, like he was perfect to like, 14 that all wow, of us. Wow. That was a like, long stretch. Well, I'm a single mom and he's my only. So we have like a yeah. much different relationship, but I realized I was being reactive. All of a sudden I was taking it personal. So I was like, Oh, and I do like Spartan races. I do uh, obstacle course races. And so uh -huh. I'm like all about the hard thing and uh -huh. that we often have to create a hard thing because we don't have hard things. And uh -huh. so now when my son does <laughs> this, I actually say like, this isn't the tiger. Because I know that yes. like that lizard brain's kicking in and I'm like, ah, like I'm in danger. And so I kind of didn't even realize I do it till you said it. That mm. might be a really good way to get yourself to practice pausing. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. By a tiger. But you also, <laughs> yeah, but you also have to have that second of recognition of, right. I need to say to myself, this is not the tiger. So yeah, it's, it's recognizing I'm triggered, whatever that feels like for each of us. And the more we are aware of, in mindfulness, we talk about the triangle of awareness, which the points of our triangle correspond to our thoughts, our body sensations and our emotions. Mm -hmm. And they're very much impacting one another, you know, all the time without our awareness. So anytime we can recognize even one point of the triangle, what and often body sensations are the most obvious, mm -hmm. you know, my jaw is tensing, I, I'm gritting my teeth, my hands are clenched, my butt's clenching, whatever that is that we do. And we all have a signature way that we individually will hold tension in our bodies. So the more tuned in, you can just recognize, oh, that's my cue, breathe, right? Just take a few breaths. And then you say your mantra to yourself, which is this is not a tiger or whatever it is that fits for each of us. And we have to, that's the thing about this parenting thing. And you talk about there's, you know, we can have guides and we can have guide books, but it's, we all have to make it individual because it's so unique. Everything is so unique. The kids, we are the situation, the, mm -hmm. the moment. Yeah. So that's what exactly makes it a practice. And there's always room to do it again better next time. And I always talk about good enough is great for parenting <laughs> because we are so hard on ourselves. I mean, it matters so much to us to do the right thing that of course we're going to take it so seriously. So I always feel like if we can give 75% of our effort, right. then, which feels super uncomfortable because you're like, oh, I'm going to mess them up. Well, you know, we're sort of messing them up anyway all the time. And we just try to... <laughs> try to cause the least amount of harm. So I have a whole theory that you don't save for college, you save for therapy. Cause oh, like, yeah. if my parents had offered to pay for like even half a therapy, that would have repaired a lot of damage right there. So <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. let's go back to this triangle though, because I work very somatically. And even with my kid clients, I work very somatically. Like right now, after the pandemic, we have, you know, epidemic of kids not really knowing their space, hitting very quick impulse control. Mm. And I keep hearing, you know, teachers are rendered not very effective right now because they are being held to the same standards of kids who never had these issues. So they, they can't right. really attend to the social emotional stuff because they're worried about the standards, but the social emotional stuff is taking front stage. Yeah. And so I've been, you know, like everybody's saying, you know, don't hit, don't hit. And I was like, well, that's not actually how you teach not to hit. Like you have, like, what, what are you feeling before you hit? Like we all want to hit, like I right. want to hit somebody on the daily. I just, I know I don't. But <laughs> so, you know, I really work with like the somatic experience. Same more though, the other two points, thoughts and emotions. 
How do you define those? Because I feel like that could be tricky for somebody who's super triggered. Like the emotions could seem like they're the thoughts or vice versa. Right. So to use the triangle, it's not in the moment of a big reactive moment. I mean, that's not not when you're going to be like, so let me pause. And what am I thinking? <laughs> Think about and my, my emotion triangle. is... <laughs> I'm raging right now. Um, no, it's not, it doesn't work like that, but it's any other points of our day. Can we drop in and notice or in an unpleasant moment, not like a huge, big moment emotionally. So a thought is, you know, what are we thinking? Often we're judging ourselves. We're judging the moment. I don't like this. I mean, if it's an unpleasant moment, all kinds of thoughts we have, you know, and that's what we know about meditation is that we only catch, we catch less than half of our thoughts during the waking hours. We just... Right we're not aware, but they drive our behavior. Same with emotions and an emotion, you know, it's kind of the emotions we talk about. I'm feeling anger, sadness, frustration, guilt, all of these things, happiness, love, joy. So we can tune in to our triangle in pleasant moments as well. And I talk about that, you know, it's a way to be more aware and enjoy the beautiful moments, which are often those ordinary in-between moments that we don't catch because we're like, gee, I have to remember to get milk at the store, whatever it is. And so you can pause as you're sitting with your little one and reading a book and and just like, what are my thoughts right now? This is so sweet. I love this moment. You know, my emotions are just love, joy, relaxed. And my body is like warm in my heart and my, my chest area feels warm. And I just feel so relaxed all over my body. So not only are you enjoying that moment more and savoring it, you're actually locking in a memory. So mm-hmm. at any point you can go back and think about, remember that moment. And I think about that I feel that in my body. I will feel that emotion from merely a thought. So that's how powerful our thoughts are, you know, as we know. And likewise, in an unpleasant moment, if I recognize I'm like, this is horrible, this is going on forever, I don't know what to do here, or, you know, this is terrible, we can get stuck there versus like, okay, hold on, I see what's happening. And anytime we can name an emotion or a thought or a body sensation, it gives us a little bit of distance from being lost in it. And then we have choice. That's where the choice comes in in that pause to breathe, to use a mantra, to take a different tack with the tantrum. Yeah, no, that's great. I also, because I think like a lot of times when I'm working with clients one-on-one, I'll be like, go get some gold stars, go put that on the calendar. Like I'll make them mark it because sometimes I too think we feel like it's all these hard moments, these hard moments, these hard moments that we forget that like, They'll call me and they'll, I don't mean to brag, but I had the best day with my kid. And I'm like, put five gold stars on your calendar. <laughs> like, I'm like, sure. Oh my gosh. This, oh, you mean this, Oh yeah. Um, I talk about that all the time with moms, you know, giving ourselves high fives, really being on the lookout because it's one of these things that, you know, we juggle a thousand balls at a time, you know, in our minds, what we're doing logistically, all of these things. And we drop one and we're like, how could I forget, you know, the permission slip or whatever it is. And it's like, oh my gosh, because I have 999 that are still yeah. in the air. But nope, it's just the one I'm worried about. So having perspective. And I liked how you just said about creating the memory. Well, first of all, I think, of course, number one, it's always easier to pick out behaviors in other people and then be like, well, (laughs) I don't like that about them. And they'll be like, hmm, do I not like that about me? Uh It's easier, probably if you're practicing this, you find your triangle in joy would probably be a lot easier for you and your brain and your soul. But how you said these memories are often in the smaller moments and I rage, I've got, I don't know how many podcasts, like memories, they're not made at Disney. They're made when you bake with your kid, these like tiny So much. And I just recorded before getting on with you, I recorded this moment I had with my son and, and how like this whole season I'm going with this touch word nourish that I want to nourish. How do we nourish ourselves, our relationships, our connection? And I said, you'll know you're there because it's when you feel like a stellar mom. Like you're just mm. like, you know, I don't know if you're rolling out the door, you're like, look at me, I'm fucking Betty Crocker. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My kid's like doing the right thing. And, uh-huh. and you have this like deep connection. You're like, this is what I thought it would be like. Yes. And so I say, those are, those are the memories. So whenever you find yourself in that, like it, like slather that on like coconut oil and just be like, yes. And so like you can, like you said, take that picture so you yes. can go back to it. And don't expect that it's going to be like that all the time. Dear God, right? It's not. I mean, it, that it's like, the snapshots, that's amazing. If we get that and we're yeah. rocking it, you know, every so often, because that's the thing is you, uh, that's what I, and I totally felt like that when I, my daughter, my first one was, you know, little, I'd be like, I think I have this figured out. I, I think I have this parenting thing figured out. Then I'd be like, oh my God, what was I thinking? That's ridiculous. You know? And now I just know like, okay. Yeah, you yeah. Know, sometimes I do. And sometimes I really don't. Yeah. I do though. I find like when I practice it myself that I get in this zone of you're just, it's easier to ride the downtimes. Cause you're like, yeah, uh, like, 
life sucks. Like people are stupid and life sucks. And I'm just the kind of, everything goes wrong for me. It just does, you know? So I'm like, okay, well, might as well just keep smiling. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Yes. All right. So let's talk. You keep saying mindfulness. I feel like mindfulness is so overused, used too much in the wrong circumstances. Let's go through like mindfulness versus meditation versus just breathing. Right. Very simply, mindfulness is paying attention to what's happening in the moment with an attitude of kindness and curiosity. So the opposite of being mindful is running on automatic pilot. And we've all done that. We get in our car and we drive somewhere familiar and we get there and we're like, whoa, I don't remember making this turn or passing this place, right? All the time. It's because in our minds, we were either in the future, we were worrying or running through our to-do list or what ifing, or we were in the past, you know, rehashing a recent conversation or a memory. So mindfulness brings us back into the moment and as best we can. And the part that gets forgotten is this attitude of kindness and curiosity. And like you're saying, allowing, I'm aware and I'm as best I can allowing it's happening. I can resist it or I can kind of see like, okay, here we are now what? So that's mindfulness. Meditation is carving out time in our day to practice the skill of mindfulness. And just like I said, you know, with swimming, it's a practice. It's a daily, as best we can practice. And I always say, if you have five minutes, I feel like we all can carve out five minutes somewhere in our day to practice it, or even one minute if you can't do five. And it's very simply, we might notice our breath. We notice our inhale, our exhale. And what we notice also very quickly is our attention drifts off, which is perfectly normal. The biggest (laughs) myth with meditation I hear is, I can't stop my thoughts. I am not good at this. I can't do it. I tried it. But it's just familiarizing ourselves with the craziness of our minds. Our minds go all over the place. So that's what meditation is. We kindly bring our attention back over and over again, almost like we're going to build up our bicep. We're going to do bicep curls. I build that, that mindfulness muscle of attention in my brain so that I can pull it out and use it. Like I was saying, it becomes a muscle memory. It becomes more familiar. I just did it this morning when I sat down to practice. And now I remember more to use it when I'm having this really challenging moment. So that's the difference. And meditation is, it's super simple. You don't need to like twist yourself in a pretzel or anything or burn incense. It's like, you can do it, just sit down and you can even listen to sounds, watch your attention drift off. You come back to hearing the sounds. It's very, very simple. It's just, it's challenging. Gabby Bernstein's first, like maybe I forget which book she really changed my mind years and years ago. Cause she said, nobody can empty their mind. Like that's for monks who don't have like a life, right? Like they got a mountaintop. She's like, that's the biggest misconception. And just so you guys know, so my meditation practice always starts with, I don't know why, but my head gets segmented where my brain is like above my eyebrows. And there's a little old lady, she's hunched over. She got like a handmade straw broom and she brushes my thoughts out and she brushes them. And I can feel them like, the letters kind of float down and disappear. You are visual. (laughs) (laughs) Once I was freed from like emptying the leaf going down the river that never got me. So, but I need my little old lady like cleaning out my brain. (laughs) Yeah, but there's still going to be more, right? So she has to be in there to kind of keep, yep. Oh, we're not going to hang on to that one. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's definitely the biggest misconception. And some people will say like, oh, I just did it. And I didn't have a thought for like a minute. I was like, well, if you just thought I don't have a thought, that's a thought. So yeah. And I always say what we really want to do is bring this attitude of amusement. If we can not take it so seriously and take ourselves so seriously to be like, wow, check that out. I am back to my to-do list again for the 50th time in five minutes right. and be amused by it because you know it's okay. It's what our minds do and there's nothing wrong with it. But now I know, I know, I know where I've been. Right. And so mindfulness seems like something you should practice just kind of throughout the day. I love that you said, what if, and cause God, is that my clients? Like the, what if, what if, and I'm like, dude, we got to work on today, like just today. And a really interesting thing that's happening that I haven't seen happen in my work before. And it's really rampant right now is for example, a child is having some sort of misbehavior in school or daycare or whatever. And they're like, I need him to listen though. I mean, he's going to have a boss one day and he's going to need to do what he doesn't want to do. And I'm like, right, right. Dude, why are we going to like, he's eight? two. He's two. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so like the what if thing. So it seems like I'm just laughing because I'm thinking about the times like I have no idea where I put my keys and they're like in the freezer. Clearly I was not present. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Monarch Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. The 
If you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. Yeah, so it seems like mindfulness, you could even drop in like kind of almost continually throughout the day. Like, I'm holding my steering wheel. I'm going to actually put on my directional and pay attention to the road. But right. meditation seems more like a practice, even if it's, it's a, a formal practice. practice. Right, right. Yeah. And I talk about what I write about in my books are mindful breaks, which are these opportunities and reminders in the midst of our full day. You don't have to stop and go close your eyes somewhere. You can bring your attention, boom, right back into that moment. And it becomes, it becomes just an ongoing practice. We start with one and then we let that become a habit. And then we stack on another mindful break. And there are you know, dozens that I have in my books, but it is exactly that. So, but it's that powerful combination of starting your day with just a few minutes of guided meditation or getting quiet, whatever you want to call that. And then sprinkling your day eventually with a bunch of mindful breaks that will pull you out of autopilot throughout your life. So you are more in control. I mean, really, so we're more in the driver's seat of what the heck is happening. And we can't always be there, of course, but more so. And then we're more intentional with where we place our time, what we prioritize, how we react, all of it, yeah. which is what we all want. What would you say for a, like a, a crazy mom? So you're, <laughs> is it like starting? Well, also, cause here in my head, I am really good at hearing resistance from the oh. masses. Yeah. So like, I don't want to meditate. I want to take a nap. I want to have a glass of wine. My me time is Netflix. Like, yeah. so like I'm a huge sleep proponent. So I'm like, go to bed. You're yes. not binging Netflix till you're exhausted. Isn't me time, but I get a lot of resistance. So I imagine you do too. So yeah, <laughs> well, totally. And I love build it. this in and like convince the, convince the crowds. <laughs> Absolutely. I love talking about this because they're yes, completely. I always say, experiment with it, try it out and get a guided meditation to get started. Because when we sit down, many people will get very frustrated as I would have as well, if I didn't have a guided voice when I first started this, you have apps, you can go to my website and I'll send a minute meditation. You know, there are plenty of ways to do it, but have someone's voice bringing you back and just make it a daily habit for two weeks. See what happens, see what you notice. I mean, that's how I started. I was definitely the skeptic who was like, I like to get shit done. Like, no, I don't want to stop, like stop. And I started meditating for a half an hour every day. Let me say when I, but I, I took a class an eight week okay. class. Okay. And that was the homework. And I'm a recovering perfectionist. So I was like, I'm doing my homework. <laughs> but in a couple of weeks, I was like, whoa, I have slowed down a little bit, which was not my MO, still is not my MO. And I am more productive. I am more efficient because I'm not forgetting where I put the keys in the freezer and I'm not right. spilling the coffee and I'm just a little bit slowed down and I am much better for it. And I was more patient with my daughter who was two or three at the time. I wasn't losing it as much and I was just enjoying things more. So I was like, oh, so I say it's one of these things. It's like anything. You have to try it out to really see and give it a little bit of time. So experiment and have that fun attitude with it. Just be curious about it. That's what I would say. And start super small, one minute, five minutes. You can do that. Don't tell me you can't. And then you can go watch Netflix and then you can go. But what I talk about is when you start to get quiet on a regular basis, you know, on a daily basis, also asking yourself at the end of that time, what am I needing and craving in this moment today, in this phase of my life? You know, sometimes we're craving rest, right? But sometimes we're craving a Spartan race and it's like, dang, I'm ready to like go kill it somewhere and do something really hard and fun. And sometimes I need a little balance, you know, so the balance is off, but it really helps us clue in and kind of get clear about what we're craving. So maybe it is Netflix, then go for it. But right. the problem is we don't pause to ask ourselves, is this really what I'm craving or is this just my habit or all I know to do to kind of numb out? Um, there's right. a difference between coming out and really being there for the Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also think, cause I, I know like I'm in New England, so fall just like hit, you know, the crisp air and, and it's like, man, you can just feel the hibernation energy. You just want to care for yourself differently, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but also I just wanted to point out you guys, a personal experience I had, I always feel like slightly psychotic. Cause I do like, I love Spartan racing. I'll train hard. And then there's these days where I'm like, I just need to be in a sauna. Like, it's just different, you know? And then I constantly forget, even though I'm well aware of this, I've talked about it a lot on the podcast. I'm entering menopause, but I'm still having irregular bleeds every now and then. I'll be like, oh, I'm in the luteal phase. Of course I want a blanket and a, and a beanbag chair and chocolate, you know? And then I'm like, but I would judge myself because we often feel like we have to be the same person, mm. you know, but our cycles make us run, oh, yeah. you know, over the month and that it's okay to be, you know, in the follicular stage, you're like, let's go, <laughs> you know? And yeah. so like, pay attention to your cycle too, because that might help you 
determine where you're at and what you are really needing and craving in those moments. Oh, 100%. And, you know, and there are those times where we are nesting or we're kind of like, we just want to go inward, you know, right before when we're PMSing often and then kind of like, then we come out of it and, and, or you might start exercising and be like, why do I feel like I'm a ton of bricks right now? My, my legs are a ton of bricks, you know, and, and it's just, it's knowing that and, and just, again, can you just bring awareness and some self-compassion, you know, which is the other piece of this, not being so hard on ourselves all the time. Yeah. I've been really harping on the idea, even with our kids, like I wish we didn't have a hierarchy of behaviors. Like they're all human behaviors, right? And they're all human emotions. Like we just tend to think of like rage is bad, you know, Mm. rage expressed inappropriately is bad, but like we had, like if all these things are more acceptable because meditation was, dude, Never. I my, I was too busy and I used to walk a high wire. I start, I used to be in the circus and I started on the high wire and that's the closest <laughs> I ever got to Zen was like, Ooh, right? yeah, but I had to be yeah. like engaged in this crazy risky behavior to do it. I started small. I started with like a minute and that so helped just being able to be successful. And then also when I first started, I was like, oh man, I suck at this. I can't. Co-. And then I was like, well, I'm the best at sucking at this. So I like had to turn it around of like, well, yeah, you suck at it. You haven't done, you know what I mean? So I like embraced the suckage because I knew I'd get over it if I could have some humor, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Or just recognize it's hard. It's hard to start something new, no matter what that is. You know, we feel like a fish out of water. Really, it's radical. If you can't do anything else, you know, if anybody is listening is literally stop in the middle of your day. And this could sound woo-woo to you, whatever. I don't care. Put your hands to your heart and take two deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. Like just doing that, this releases oxytocin, the connection hormone in our bodies, and it calms us down. It reminds us to be kind to ourselves. Some women will still say like, I'm not doing that. I'm like, that's fine, but try it. (laughs) Try it, it's fine. Just try it. It's that pausing, it is so radical. And I am guilty of this too. When I am super stressed or overscheduled, I am like, I do not have time to breathe. Don't tell me, I I don't have time to breathe. That's why it's so important to just stop and do that one deep breath, you will feel the difference. You're more in control. You're more aware. And we know that's what's happening in our brains. Well, and also just the slowdown in general, because like you said, not only were you more productive because you're not tripping over yourself, you're not spilling the coffee, but I do feel like it's like anxiety feeds itself, right? And I'll get frantic and good Lord, sometimes it'll take me dropping nine things before I'm like, sit down. Yes. Take a couple of breaths because right. like you're on high gear. You're not even yeah. paying attention, you know? Yes. I hesitate to say slow down so you can be more productive because I'm sort of anti-productivity culture. <laughs> but yeah, but those days that it goes so effortless because you're like, I'm super mindful and I'm, and I'm not multitasking. I'm getting one thing done after another. And then you turn around and you're like, look at me. I did laundry and I even folded it. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to take too much of your time, but you have to tell us not so much professionally, but personally. So you had a teen and a toddler at the same time. Yes. And I'm hoping you were young. Cause one thing I realized about having a baby late in life is nature did not design teenagers to be with women in menopause. Cause that's a lot of hormonal fluctuations. Going oh, on in my house. I was not young. My husband, well, he jokes. So I don't think it's that funny. He's like every decade. So 31, 41. And then when I, I already passed 51 and he, and I was like, nope, that ship has sailed. So forget that. So yeah, yeah. no, but yeah, Although yeah, I it is want one because We've learned so much, right? I was like, dude, I would have <laughs> this out this time. <laughs> I think we need to borrow somebody else's for a while. I don't know. That's, that's my thing. I like right. to sleep. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So how was that? The in-between or doing no, both, I guess. The, having the two kids at the, such different ages. Yeah, age. yeah. I mean, I think what I've loved about it is, I mean, I had a built-in babysitter, let me say, because my daughter was like a second mommy. So having her first was really kind of fun and helpful. It's been, I think, birth control for her as well because she's seen how hard it is, you yeah. know? Yeah, that's so, awesome. It, yeah, it's a good thing. And, you know, I've just learned not to sweat the small stuff as much, which has really been a gift. And my little guy is like a little king around here because he's just like, you know, we're all laid back and it's he's laid back. And, you know, and my poor daughter, you know, I was so intent on trying to get it right all the time. So I've really mellowed out and probably just aged, like you said, (laughs) because I just don't have as much of the energy in that regard. But it's intentional. So much doesn't matter. And I've learned kind of just really getting clear on what does matter and focusing on that. Yeah, it's so true. Even like, I often think about like the stuff, like if I would have a baby now, I'd be like, two onesies. That's yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> not, yeah. not half the crap I bought, wouldn't have. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so tell us where people can find you. And I know you have a couple of courses in addition to your book. So what's that all about? Tell us about that. 
Right. So find me Shonda Morales, S-H-O-N-D-A-M-O-R-A-L-I-S.net. I'm sure you'll link that up. I'm on social media and my books are anywhere books are sold. So I have a course that's going to be starting in November. It's a six week group for Breathe Mama Breathe. And it's a group coaching course. So kind of moms for your audience, moms in the trenches with little ones and kind of using these tools and just getting started so that you can that very short meditation, these mindful breaks. So you can enjoy life more, the journey and not sweat the small stuff as much and learn how to, to cope and use that. Because I, I just want to say too, is I, you know, the reason I wrote this book, my first book, Breathe Mama Breathe is I found myself with postpartum depression after my son was born. And I was totally thrown by that because I had a 10 year old. I thought I knew what I was doing. I'm a therapist. I should, you know, but we don't know, you know, we all have those times where the circumstances kind of come together and we find ourselves in these situations or moments. And so we all need this. It's, you know, this is universal that we need to take care of ourselves as moms and give ourselves a break and set, like you're saying, celebrate, celebrate the wins. Yeah. I was just working with a client. We were dying laughing because I was like, can you even believe the design of this? Like, first of all, you get pregnant. That is whatever it is, right? Then like after the most exhausting night or two nights or whatever nights, for me, three nights of your life, you push this baby out. And then how are we in charge of the most vulnerable creatures at our worst? Like we're oh, underslept and we're yes. like weak in position, like we're hormones all over the place. I was like, this was bad design. <laughs> like worse than feet. I always think feet are terrible design. So I'm like, how are we walking around these tiny planks? <laughs> like we should have big planks. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And I'll tell you what decimated me was the sleep deprivation. That was one thing that, you know, I found to be, you know, that was really kind of pushed me over the edge. But anyway, yeah. yes, to your point. Yes. So course and uh, books and working with Social. women to help them and moms. Oh, thank you. This has been so great. We can't stress breathing and self-care and like that pause. I just feel like we could talk about it like every day and still moms would be like, nope, nope, nope. I got my things to do. I'm okay. Yes. <laughs> no, yes. No, it will catch up with you. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Shonda. Thanks, Jamie. Take care. Okay. Bye, everyone. Just a reminder, if you need additional resources, I have Oh Crap Potty Training. I have Oh Crap, I Have a Toddler. Those books are available everywhere you want to find a book. <laughs> you can also go to my website, jamieglowacki.com, where you can book private sessions with me, buy any of my courses. Those are really geared towards potty training help. And also I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook anymore and I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, jamie.glowacki, and I do a lot of lives and uh, usually posting a lot of good information. So those are extra resources for you. And as always, rock on. Have an awesome day.